Hi, I'm Tim and this is part 6 of the course on building products with JavaScript. And today I want to talk about dockerizing our backend project, setting up continuous integration to automatically run tests for it, and setting up continuous delivery to get the complete Docker images for it that you can just pull and use on your own. So, first of all, um, if you watched my last stream where I did all of that, this uh, video is probably won't be too much used to you. Again, it's going to be quite short, uh, but you know, we're sort of finalizing our backend project, so uh, bear with me for a bit here. Let's start with dockerization. So, what I did is I created this uh, Docker file here, which basically uh, compiles our application into a standalone Docker container that you can just run. You don't need to install Node.js, you don't need to install any dependencies, it does all of that for you. Uh, Docker files has a very simple syntax, so um, let's just do line by line uh, sort of walkthrough uh, so that I can explain what exactly is happening uh, over here. So the first line is uh, we pick the base image. Uh, you can pick the base image that will do pretty much uh, any or will support pretty much any modern programming language or environment. So in this case, we're using Node.js, which is obviously the what we're using for the backend development. But you might as well say I want just an Ubuntu here or I want Java or I want, you know, Maven or uh, whatever you might imagine. Uh, if you actually go to the um, uh, hub.docker.com you have a very nice search over the images here, uh, which you can uh, basically find the official ones and you can have a look at what they offer and how to use them. They generally have a very extensive guides over here. So we're using Node.js. Um, since we don't provide any tags, it's gonna pull the latest one, which at the moment is 6.5. After that, we create the um, application folder. So run command will basically just execute any bash command you can imagine. This is like basically run something for me. In this case, we just say make dear, right? So we create this uh, slash app, which will be in a root folder. And then we say, this is a Docker command. We say that this is gonna be our work dear, which means any other commands that are gonna be executed, gonna be executed inside of this folder. Right, so then we are gonna do a bit, like this is kind of a small trick. Uh, this is a Docker thing. So the idea is that we will cache the npm install dependencies. To do that, what we're going to do is we're going to first copy the package.json file to our application folder and then execute npm install. So basically it will only copy the package.json and then run npm install and those steps will be cached. And as long as the package.json remains the same, so if you don't change dependencies or commands in there or whatever, those uh, basically those what five steps they always will be skipped so whenever you rebuild your docker container only this copy and run babel uh, compile will be executed so once we've done that we copy our application files actually and there's another step this is basically something i added uh, because at the moment we have this index.js which uses the uh, babel core register hook which is fine for development but it's not recommended to be run in the deployment because you know it makes things a bit slower and it's generally not a good practice to do so so what i did is very simple i basically just uh, run the babel command and say compile our source to the folder called lib and the final line is I specify what command we actually want to run once the build finishes. And this basically will run our compiled source code. It will just execute Node.js and call it with a lib slash index.js file, which is uh, basically our compiled source code. As easy as that. Um, there is one trick. So this is, I just did that to show you how exactly it works, but you can actually skip most of those. Uh, because there are very handy on build images over here. And if we open the Docker files, the cool thing about Docker is that most of the time you can just have a look at the Docker file and know exactly how they were built. You have this on build images that do all of that for you. So as you can see here, they uh, inherit from the node images as well. They create the work gear and uh, assign it as a work gear to the Docker. And then they have this on build thing, which will be basically executed once you build the image. So as you can see, they do exactly the same. They copy the package JSON, they run npm install, they copy your packages. And in this case, they assign command as npm start. So if you have your command as npm start, you can just build with like, you know, here's a Docker file, node on build, and it will work. This is actually kind of amazing. 
But you know, in our case, we had to pre-compile some Babel stuff and uh, change the command line. So basically, if you want, you can just do that on build and it will work. But you know, for learning purposes, I did all of that myself to just show you how exactly that um, behaves. Right, so um, this is one of the things. And uh, basically now you can go to hub.docker.com and uh, you can find the build image here, which is now located under yamalite slash bpwjs minus server. As you can see, here's a Docker command. So we can actually say uh, Docker pull and it will actually pull this image from the Docker hub. I already have it, obviously. And the cool thing is that we can actually say Docker run. Uh, let's do it interactive and auto removed. And we are gonna uh, forward our port, which is, I forgot which one was it? Uh, was it 8080? Yeah, so we're gonna forward port 8080 to 8080 on this host. And then I'm just gonna copy this image. Uh, and um, it will break obviously because it needs a database actually. So this is another thing, uh, come on, die. Now I want, uh, my Docker lately have been acting up for some reason and uh, did not, does not always uh, kills the images by control C properly. I'm not sure why that happens. Uh, let me just clean out. I have some other Docker stuff running there. Uh, remove all of that stuff. Right, so um, yeah, obviously it will fail right now because it tries to connect to a database which is not there. So let's talk about how to actually run that uh, in a correct manner. So we, if you remember, we have our um, command which starts the database, which is now written as the uh, Node.js script. But you know, in this case, let's just run it manually. So the thing is that we actually don't need all of that, uh, like all of the bindings here, uh, binding of ports and volumes and everything when we're running as Docker. I mean, volumes might be a good idea if you want to persist your thing, but ports, this is something that you actually don't need. So we're going to run it as a daemon. We are not going to care about volumes right now because this is just for the demo. But you know, again, if you want to persist your data, you actually want a volume. Uh, so we're going to say name experts DB, and then we're going to uh, launch rethink DB. So if we have a look now, you will see that indeed we have the thing to be running and it doesn't have any uh, links. So it doesn't have any ports exposed. They are or linked to the host. Yeah, they are only exposed internally. So uh, now I'm going to go back to our uh, old command. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say link experts DB. And the next thing is uh, we need to tell our uh, container how exactly do you uh, use this database. So I modified the config.js here to allow usage of um, environmental variables. And basically all I need to do now is to say that uh, our DB URI is experts DB because Docker, when you link images, will assign them the host name which equals to the image name, basically, or the instance name. Um, link, did I mess something up with the name? Uh, yeah, I messed something up with the name, right? Okay, so it, it's gonna be Express DB, why not? <laughs> Let's launch that. And uh, yeah, as you can see now, it's actually working. And if I go to my browser and go to the Docker dev, which is my uh, fake Docker host name, we should actually see our server, which tells us hello world, and we can see all requests going. So that's quite nice. Um, I will talk a bit about the Docker Compose and things like this that simplify deployment when we get to actual deployment step after we already finished the front end. But you know, for now, this is basically you can just pull it, launch it with your database, and it will work and it can be used for development and whatever you want. And basically, you know, once you kill it, and my Docker doesn't want to kill it again, so we're gonna stop uh, both of them uh, manually. Obviously, yeah, there we go. So we stopped the database and started crashing. That's fine, come on, stop it. So, you know, that's, that's the Docker part. So now the thing is that obviously you don't want to build this uh, image and publish it manually. And, and also you want to test your uh, commits. So whenever you commit and push something, you wanna be sure that it actually doesn't break anything. So how do you do that? Well, that's the part of, um, continuous integration, right? So this is what's called continuous integration. The fact that you, when, whenever you push your code or do pull requests or uh, things like this, 
your code is automatically tested uh, against, or you know, the test suite is automatically executed and you can actually be sure that everything is working. All right, so it's now uh, done. So how do you do that? Well, there's a bunch of uh, continuous integration services out there and you know, it's getting more and more popular. Uh, I'm pretty sure you've heard of uh, things like say Travis CI and uh, I don't know, Circle CI, there's a whole bunch of them. So we, as you can see, we even have some uh, cases running even right now. I think I had some, yeah, I have my MicroWork library here on Travis, it works pretty well. Travis works really, really well for a small, very focused uh, things that don't require anything fancy. And you can just say, no, here's my uh, environment, which is like Node.js or whatever. And then you just do something with it. Um, the thing is that we want to then transform from continuous integration into continuous deployment and continue, uh, continuous delivery and then continuous deployment. So for this case, I actually took the GitLab. Um, they have, like, if you are not familiar with GitLab, it's basically a competitor for GitHub, but they are open source. Like, uh, I think most of their features are, except for the, some enterprise stuff, which they basically sell. <coughs> Sorry, uh, and uh, they actually offer a lot more features than GitHub does. One of them is a continuous integration platform that is integrated into the GitLab itself. So all you have to do is to create this uh, GitLab CI YAML file and describe what exactly you wanna do. Uh, and the cool part is that it's Docker-based, so you can actually run anything here. So as you can see here, we are running inside of the Docker uh, this uses the image from Docker Hub, which is Docker latest. So that means we have a Docker command line. And we start a service which called Docker Dint, which is the Docker daemon, uh, so that we can actually do Docker commands. And in this case, we have three stages, build, test, and release. So uh, build obviously just builds it. Test is our tests. It makes sure that we don't release broken thing and release basically releases um, the hub image. So um, I closed it actually already. I know, there we go, that's the correct one, there we go. So basically the, the release stage pushes this image to the hub registry. Um, the cool thing is that all of this is done automatically. So uh, first of all, I've set up the mirroring. So in case of GitLab Enterprise or GitLab.com, which is provided for free, you have um, mir repository mirroring which in this case is set up to mirror the um, our public repository on GitHub. This repo is also public, so if you want to have a look at it, just go go and have a look. Uh, I haven't you know made anything private, so because there's like secret things and everything, uh, I will talk about them in a moment. But as you can see, it's mirrored and it's updated every hour, I think. So which is absolutely fine. Uh, there is not that many changes, and you know if you want, you can actually force update it and. Um, works really well. So let's have a look at the uh, GitLab CI file. First of all, I define some variables. So this is basically our test image name, which is created uh, after build or during build and first tested running our test commands. And this is our release image, which is then once test actually passes, released to the, um, the Docker Hub. So as you can see here, before we have a before script, um, this is basically a very straightforward thing. It's just logins into the Docker Hub with my username and a secret Docker Hub password that is actually set in the, uh, the variables here. So you can set secret variables uh, for deployment that you don't want to sort of commit to the code, you know, because obviously this is open source code and I don't want you guys know my uh, Docker Hub password because it's sort of a private thing and I don't want you to publish anything from me, you know, you know how that works. All right, so, and in this case, we have three uh, cases defined for our three different stages. We have the build server first, which is assigned to the stage build. And uh, all it does is just basically uh, Docker pull uh, server image, uh, Docker build minus pull, sorry. So basically, it builds our uh, image with a tag server test image. So basically whatever the branch we're building from, it builds the server folder, which is our REST server. And uh, minus minus pull flag means that it should pull the latest uh, base image every time so that we always have like nice clean up to date image here. 
And once it's done building it, it just pushes it to the Docker Hub. So the reasoning is very simple. This test image, it might be broken, but it always will be online. So, you know, if, if something is wrong, that I can actually pull it myself and test it manually. So the next step is test. Once again, those stages are completely separate, so they won't be sharing anything. This stage will be executed from scratch and won't have access to anything that was in the build stage. So as you can see here, it actually pulls our test image from the hub to make sure that it's actually what was pushed and that we actually test the latest thing. And then it just runs our image with npm test command. Really straightforward. So once all the tests are passing and if and only if they are passing, we get to the release stage which does uh, pretty much the same thing. Again, you know, it doesn't have access to anything, so it pulls the test image. It then tags the image with the release image tag, which is the uh, latest one, and then pushes it to a uh, hub. So nothing fancy here. And it only does it on a master branch because we don't want to release our development branches or, you know, whatever else, like feature branches, whatever else we will have. But we actually do have the test images for all of those branches, which is uh, pretty awesome, if you ask me. So now that we actually look through the file, we can go into the uh, GitLab and have a look at the pipelines here, where you will actually see the fancy representation of all those tests. So if we open the latest one, we will actually see the steps. And right now we have one uh, case per all of those stages, so build, test, and release. But once we have more, once we have the client side, once we have the desktop client, once we have the mobile client, we will see all of them here in this same screen, which is, I think, really cool. And you also see, you know, how much time it took to execute it, how much, um, if it passed or not, and you can actually click on any stage and look at the log file so you can see, okay, all the tests are passing here. We have 92 tests pass in 4.8 seconds. Everything is great. So it's uh, pretty handy, you know. Um, you can also get this, uh, so there's this past page badge from the GitLab itself, on the GitLab itself, but obviously we don't have it here in uh, GitHub. So you can actually get it and put it in there and you can actually do the coverage as well with the GitLab CI. So this is something I'm intending to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is the GitLab CI file explanation. Um, I think that basically covers everything I've done during the last live stream. And um, before I wrap it up, I basically want to say what I'm going to do during the next um, lesson. So this is going to be the last part of the backend uh, lessons. I am going to talk about preparing your open source project to uh, be delivered to people, basically, you know, because at the moment we sort of uh, built it and, you know, we now know it works. We now have the unit tests. Uh, we now have the Docker file, which you can actually pull. But there's a lot of things lacking here. There's like brief mention of license here, which doesn't really explain if our server is licensed under the same license. Uh, although, you know, you can assume that it actually is. There's like proper readme file missing that explains how to properly launch it and this kind of stuff. So well, the next live stream and the next video, I'm actually not sure if I'm going to live stream it because it sounds like it's going to be a quite short as well, like 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to talk about what actually you will need to have in your uh, repository when you are publishing it to people and what's important to have, what's kind of must have and what is good to have. So that's it, I think, um, unless I'm forgetting something and I don't think I do. So uh, this was part six of the course on building products with JavaScript. Thank you for sticking around for that long. I hope you found something useful in this part as well. And uh, as always, see you during the next video. Bye.